All right, welcome, welcome, everybody. This is Grady from the Third Hour of Power, and also from This Mormon Life. And with me this week is my buddy Riley. How's it going, Riley? It's going good. How are you doing? I'm fantastic. So for those of you who are joining us for the first time, the Third Hour of Power is a podcast where we go over the lessons from the teachings of the presidents of the church. Uh, this week's a little bit different because I am out of town. I'm out in Arizona looking for a place to live and a job to work. And so Riley has been gracious enough to be my host and let me stay at his house. And so we're doing things a little bit different, but we're still going to talk about the content of the lesson this week, which is number 11, uh, Honoring the Priesthood Keys Restored Through Joseph Smith. And I, I like this a lot because we've been talking about keys, it seems, really frequently, especially in the most recent general conference with Elder Oaks talking about priesthood keys and kind of the difference between keys, authority, and power in the priesthood. That talk does a good job of differentiating those. Um, But this week we're talking about keys, and I liked from the life of President Joseph Fielding Smith, um, there is an example of when President Smith, or sorry, he was uh, at the time uh, an elder in the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, so he was an apostle, and he had President... Grant. There you go, President Heber J. Grant. And they were talking about a serious issue, and Elder Smith, the apostle, uh, he had one opinion on the matter, and President Grant had an opposite opinion on the matter, and he came to talk with Elder Smith about his decision and how he had prayed about it. And even though at the time Elder Smith disagreed, he respected the keys of President Grant and his ability to receive revelation. And so he chose to fully support President Grant um, in this action that he had. And I, th- and I think it's going to be a good thing in class. Um, someone's probably going to ask, what things has the prophet asked us to do um, with his keys that maybe we'd had trouble doing or didn't agree with, but knew were important and trusted him as his authority? Uh, the second thing I liked in this story, or this section, about s- from the life of Joseph Fielding Smith, uh, he talked about Elder uh, Nathan Eldon Tan- Nathan Eldon Tanner and uh, Elder Tal- Tanner, he was called as a member of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles um, in 1962, and then one year later, uh, he was called to be part of the First Presidency. Um, President Smith was a, an apostle at the time, and so even though um, President Tanner was a newly minted apostle of only a year, and President Smith an apostle for about, about 50 years at the time, that put Elder Tanner above him as far as seniority goes um, and authority. And it's a, uh, it was a neat thing. He says that when I was called to the first presidency, I'm sorry, when I was called to the first presidency, though he was the senior, I'm going to go back here and say this again. This is uh, President Tanner speaking, uh, and he's talking about President Smith. He says that when President Tanner, when I was called to the first presidency, he was the senior member of the 12 and had been in the office for over 50 years. He showed great respect for me in that position and gave me full support and confidence. So even though President Tanner was new to the apostleship, um, his position of first presidency um, put him above President Smith, but President Smith still respected him for his office. It uh, it reminds me of the show or the book Band of Brothers, um, which is based on a true story when uh, there's Captain Sobel and Major Winters. Major Winters was actually under Captain Sobel during basic training, um, but Major Winters was promoted and promoted to eventually becoming a major, and Captain Sobel was walking past pres- Major <sighs> Captain Sobel was walking past Major Winners and was trying to avert eye contact, didn't want to be seen. And as he walked by, Major Winners acknowledged that uh, President Sobel was not Captain Sobel was not looking at him. And he tells Captain Sobel that you salute the rank and not the man. And basically saying that you respect that Major Winners is a major, which is over a captain, and so that that earns him a degree of respect. And it's the same thing with the priesthood. They are men that are given position, are given keys to receive revelation for us, and we should we should respect them. Yeah, also in that, in that section, I, you were maybe going to talk on it, but I, I read it, and it said that uh, he served and honored his priesthood leaders uh, in his own ward, which I've heard many times apostles and prophets go in and have to get interviewed by the bishop for temple recommends and different things like that and they always say it's weird for tithing settlements to go and talk like a bishop's always like I'm sitting talking to a prophet or an apostle (laughs) and I'm asking him questions that normally I feel like he should be asking me and he actually said that one time when he was serving 
when he was a, a member of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, he said, I have no right to baptize one of my own children without first going to the bishop in that ward where I live to get his consent because he holds the keys for that ward, and I, which I belong as a member. I, I, I mean, that's, that's got to be a, a huge humbling experience right, for the bishop, but also for him to, hey, I, as a Quorum of the Twelve, I, I do hold all the, the keys and, and authority to all the gospel and priesthood authority, but I have to go to, to you as a bishop to get that okay for my, my own ward. And I think that was a very cool thing to hear. And it kind of segues right into the next section, which is priesthood keys are the power and authority to direct the Lord's work on this earth. Um, there is a difference between receiving an office in the priesthood and receiving the keys of the priesthood. Um, uh, all men who are uh, people who are called into the priesthood, they are ordained to that office. And yet they're special. It says they're special directing authorities bestowed upon them who call to preside. These are called the keys. Uh, I found it really interesting when I was, uh, I was set apart as an elder and then in the Melchizedek priesthood and then about six, eight months later I got called to go on a mission and then I got given different keys to become a missionary and I sat and listened to it and it wasn't a new office, it was just different keys and when I got released as an elder it was, I didn't lose any, I didn't go down in a ranking as a, as a priesthood, I'm still an elder but I just don't have those keys to perform that part of the, of the priesthood which I found very interesting on, on that and it's, it's definitely there's a difference between priesthood keys and priesthood authority that we need to understand well I think that's kind of the thing about it is that you know our priesthood it gives us the authority to do these things but then the keys unlock our authorization to do those things so the keys unlock the authority and the power allows us to do it in section two, it talks about how the Lord sent his holy messengers from his priesthood, I'm sorry, from his presence, to restore the keys of the priesthood. And in section two, it talks about how the keys were all restored through John the Baptist and through the, uh, Peter, James, and John. But then um, all kinds of other visitations came to restore those keys, Elias, um, it was uh, Noah came, Elijah, all these keys that were restored to Joseph Smith that gave him the authority to run the church and to administer the ordinances of it. Uh, it talks about here that the Lord does not recognize any ordinance or ceremony, even though it be done made, I'm sorry, even though it be made or performed in his name, unless it is in accordance with his will and done by one who is recognized as his authorized servant. You know, that happened a lot. Um, as a missionary, and it also happened, you know, even when I help with the missionaries, people that may have been baptized in a faith that they, they found comfort in, they found strength in, and then now learning that they need to get baptized again. And the question always comes, you know, does that mean that my baptism doesn't count? Does that mean that my baptism isn't recognized by God? And sometimes that's a hard question to answer, and you have to say sometimes, you know, you can just say, no, it doesn't, which is kind of a blunt way to respond. Uh, I say it's correct, but may not be the best way to make friends. But just helping people understand that although a baptism or an ordinance may have been important to them, and I'm sure that God loves their decision to make a commitment to God or to him, it doesn't mean that the ordinance is valid um, according to God. So that there still needs to be these things done under order and under authority by those who are authorized to perform those ordinances. And then in section three, it goes on. Yeah, I mean, it, it, there's a <clears throat> in section three. It talks more about the the keys of the that over the church and how the president of the church holds all those keys. Um, shortly before the martyrdom of Joseph Smith, it says that he bestowed to the twelve all all the all the keys and ordinances that were necessary for them to hold and carry on this great the great work he puts in there as and great glorious work and and universal salvation. Um, I, he kind of knew his, his time was coming end as a, as a prophet, I feel. And he knew that he had to, to put those keys out there to be able to have the church keep going. Um, <laughs> yeah, um, it's, it's very interesting. On, kind of goes back to the keys in the earlier one where he, everyone in the 12 apostles do have that ability to, to be a, the president of the church or the prophet. So if one does pass away, that it doesn't all of a sudden stop. It just it says that the senior member of the presidency of the of the quorum of the twelve becomes the prophet, and his keys are then unlocked. It doesn't need to have a, a special like angels don't need to come back down and redo all that again. It's, it was given down. The keys are then given to him. 
Yeah, they almost have, you know, dormant keys. They have all the keys to do these things, but only the president of the church has the authority to exercise those keys. And so that when the, a president passes away, uh, the senior apostle can take over as president of the church, and then those keys become unlocked, and he becomes authorized to use those. And uh, I, it's with the keys, it goes all the way down to bishop, to elders, quorum, president. All these priesthood leaders have keys to operate in certain capacities. Um, it's always an interesting thing when someone doesn't live in their own ward boundaries and they want to attend uh, a different ward. Or they, I guess they want to attend a ward they don't live in the boundaries of. And, you know, there's always that, that question about, you know, the bishop saying that he doesn't have authority um, over that member. They're not, they're not his. Uh, it says that when a man is ordained to the office of a bishop, he is given the keys of presidency over the ward in which he resides. And I think that's an important thing is that, you know, a bishop has authority in his own ward. Once he leaves the ward, if he were to go visit someone else's ward, he doesn't have authority in that ward to preside there. Um, likewise, those who visit the ward, he doesn't have authority over. Um, only those that reside there and, and live in that ward, those are who he has um, authority over. And the ordinances that happen in that ward also go through him. Um, Riley talked about it earlier, about how you know President Smith saying that if he was ever to go to a ward and do a baptism or ordain someone to the priesthood, that although he has the power and authority through the priesthood to do those ordinances, he needs the priesthood keys to authorize him to do so. And so the the bishop where that member lived would need to say, okay, you're, you can do that ordinance, and then he's permitted to do it via his priesthood authority. But the keys unlock that authority for us to be able to do that. Same thing with, you know, with baptism, ordination, those things all are required to be done through through those keys. Yeah, and then the, the last section talks about the united voice of those who hold the keys of the kingdom will always guide us where the Lord wants to, us to be. Um, it is, it's very interesting. They kind of talked about it, and it said that uh, an individual may fall by the wayside or have views or give counsel which falls short of what the Lord intends, but the voice of the first presidency and and the united voice of those others who hold them, hold with them the keys of the kingdom shall always guide the saints and the world in the path where the Lord wants them to, to be. Uh, it, I think that's a very interesting point that, that they're a very nice, comforting thing to have, that there is people as people, we are human, and we do have that where we could, could stray away. But if we listen to the whole priesthood, the first presidency and the quorum of the twelve, and listen to what they say, that God will never let all of them be led astray at the same time, that they will be a united voice. And it's, it's always usually a conference time. You listen to it, and it seems like every conference there's almost a universal theme. And, and even it goes all the way down to who what they ask everyone to t- give talks about. And if you look at it, it's like every it, – it, that's true. I mean, in each conference there was a universal theme, and, and it's how we need to be led. Yeah, well, I think it's interesting too because with general conference, you know, no one's given an assignment um, of what they should <clears throat> speak about. Everyone just uses prayer and, set and inspiration, and they feel inspired of what to pray about. And then what happens is that because everyone gets their messages from the same source, which is God, they all oftentimes come into alignment. And so there all is often themes of conference that seem to come through. And sometimes that's just because it's you know it's the theme that we pull out of it because it's something maybe that's relevant to us in our lives. But you know for the most times we find some sort of theme to conference or some sort of thread that pulls all these talks together. Riley, any last minute things you want to add to this lesson? No, it's about I think covered pretty well. It was a lot about the priesthood key and, and power, and it was, it was very interesting to hear. Yeah, I would definitely recommend to look up um, Dallin H. Oaks' talk that he gave in priesthood session of our most recent general conference where he talks about the difference between priesthood power, priesthood authority, and priesthood keys. Having that knowledge will be a great help to you uh, tomorrow or next week as you go into the lesson. Um, so on behalf of my friend Riley here, who has been my gracious host this week, thank you for bearing with us as we did a little bit of a rough version of the podcast this week. But we'll be with you again next week. We want to thank our benefactors, This Week in Mormons, for hosting our podcast for us and, uh, and sharing that with the masses. Check them out on Sunday School Bonanza, where they talk about Sunday School, or This Week in Mormons, the podcast, where they talk about current events in Mormon culture. Um, my name is Grady of This Mormon Life. That's this-mormon-life.com. Or just Google it. You'll find wherever I'm at. I'm on Instagram now, which is pretty exciting. Uh, Twitter, Facebook, 
Instagram's important, Riley. Yeah. You have no idea. Yeah. It's true. Know. It's true. And uh, I had some interesting posts this week. I went to Disneyland this week, and uh, I wanted to share some of that, that experience. Also, some information about my, uh, my BB girl that is kind of catching some traction. And so if you want to learn about my family, check it out. You'll like it. And until next time, we bid you all a fond adieu. We have been born as we are.